Uh, now, having said all that, Eddington was partly right. There is sort of a law of nature that prevents stars from behaving in this foolish manner. Uh, so uh, to understand that, what happens when white dwarfs, uh, when the white dwarf collapses? It's got to get rid of its electrons, because the problem is the way this electron degeneracy pressure works, you can't squeeze electrons any closer together uh, than they are in a white dwarf. So now you have to get rid of electrons. And so what do you do? You combine the electrons and the protons, and you turn them into neutrons plus neutrinos. These are neutrinos. They stream out. And so uh, you end up with something that's made entirely out of neutrons. So the whole star uh, turns into neutrons. Uh, a chemist would think of this as essentially turning the whole star into one atom, into one atomic nucleus. An atomic nucleus with no pro an atom an atom with no protons, no <laughs> electrons, and ten to the fifty-seven neutrons. And you could imagine, you know, putting that somewhere on the periodic table. Uh, Astronomers call these things neutron stars, uh, and they exist. They were discovered in the 1960s. And a typical neutron star, a couple times the mass of the sun, uh, has uh, mass equals two times the mass of the sun, radius of about 10 kilometers. And you can work out the density for that. Density is a billion times greater, I'll leave this as an exercise, uh, greater than for white dwarfs. So instead of a cubic centimeter of the stuff weighing a ton, it now weighs a billion tons, uh, and you're having a tough time moving it around. But 10 kilometers. That's getting close to the Schwarzschild radius. Remember, we calculated the Schwarzschild radius of the sun was about three kilometers. And in fact, if you calculate uh, the Schwarzschild radius of a star in terms of the Schwarzschild radius of the sun, uh, let's see, you get 2gm over c squared, where m is the mass of the star, divided by 2g mass of the sun over c squared. Uh, so the G's and the C's all cancel here, and you get M star over M sun. So if the Chandrasekhar mass of the sun is equal to three kilometers, as we calculated, uh, the uh, Schwarzschild radius of a star with whose mass happens to equal three times the mass of the sun is going to be three times ten kilometers or ten kilometers. And that's equal to the radius of a neutron star. So a neutron star with mass greater than three times the mass of the sun has a radius less than its Schwarzschild radius. And that's a black hole, remember? Uh, and uh, the, thing, the key thing here is that there are lots of stars with mass more than three times the mass of the sun. We don't see them as black holes because they're still in hydrostatic equilibrium. But eventually, they're going to run out of nuclear fuel and they're going to collapse. Now, in fact, during the course of, of the star's life, one of the things I glossed over is stars tend to lose mass as they live. Uh, and so they don't end up with the same mass they started with. But stars with initial masses at the beginning of their lifetime uh, greater than, oh, I don't know, something like 30 times the mass of the sun, sun will end up with masses greater than three times the mass of the sun, and then there's nothing to stop their collapse. What happens is they turn into neutron stars, but they turn into neutron stars whose Schwarzschild radius, is, whose radii are smaller than the Schwarzschild radius, and that uh, is a black hole. So they collapse down into black holes. And so you expect a large number of black holes to actually exist. This is uh, what happens to massive stars at the end of their life. Uh, and so uh, uh, we expect there to be that there are 
many black holes. And so the question we'll be exploring in uh, the rest of this segment of the class is, uh, how can you find these things? Uh, what are the properties of these things? From a theoretical point of view, what does Einstein's theory of relativity suggest that these things are going to behave like? And then the, the big question is, once you've found some and you have a theory for what they behave like, then you can ask the question, does the actual behavior of these objects conform to the theoretical expectations? Another way of saying that is, was Einstein right? Is general relativity the correct theory to describe these very exotic objects? And so that's what we'll be talking about uh, in the rest uh, of this section of the course. Now, let me turn back to the previous section of the course, which, was, uh, which culminated last time in this little test. Uh, and uh, I think we're ready to hand these back. Is that true?